So, yeah, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about programming with millions of examples, and I'd like to start with something that you probably know, that programming today is uh, more and more about putting stuff together, about putting components together, and not really about writing low-level code, and there's a lot of components out there. And components, again, they expose APIs, so you can... Uh, access via API, so you have like a file, it has open, close, read, and write, this is my own kind of file interface, and you can use it by calling these methods of this component, etc. But the problem is that API components, uh, the components of the APIs are kind of complicated, and here's an example of some API, so it's not a software API, but can anyone guess what API this is for? Washing machine one. Toilet, all right, yes, yeah, so this is a Japanese toilet, and, and, the, reason, and the reason I'm showing you this, <laughs> the reason I'm showing this is, is because it shares a lot of things, a lot of similarity with uh, software APIs. So first of all, it exposes much more than what I need. Uh, I want to use only a very limited functionality. <laughs> Second is, there's probably some sequence of buttons that I have to push in order to get stuff done, and I don't know what it is. The third is that documentation is absolutely useless for me. I mean, I don't read <laughs> this kind of stuff. And the most important thing for us is that had someone shown me an example of how to use this without the implications, uh, then I would immediately know what to do, all right? So this is, the sim this is why I showed this, and this is the last toilet slide of this talk. And really, we'll talk more about APIs that look like this. So this is an API uh, from the Android Media Recorder. And this picture is actually the official documentation. Like when you open the Android documentation, this is the explanation of how to use the API. All right, I will not go through all the details, but you set the video, set audio, source, something, set output format, and do all these things. And it's not clear which path you should take through this kind of automata. So I should say that for a, this is actually quite involved for a single type. It's quite uncommon for a single component to have such an involved thing. But if you look across multiple components, it's very common to have complicated sequences which you don't know how to choose from. But, you know, as I said, I want to learn from examples. So there are, examples are prevalent. If you look at GitHub, it has uh, over 8 million repositories and it's growing daily, over 3.5 million users. And if I just go to GitHub and look for this media recorder, which I just showed you, I'll find over 10K examples, right? And, the, the, and I can also, as probably many of you do, go to Stack Overflow and look even for more example. And the question is, which example should I use? I mean, I can, I can actually show you uh, a few here. Uh, so if I go to this uh, GitHub. I hope that you can see it. Uh, pick Java code for this med recorder. So I can look the first example, my recorder. It's empty, all right? So that doesn't help me at all. Uh, I can go over some other here. I don't know which one. Let's take this one. So this is actually, I don't know, again, something that is empty. Another one can be a factory. I will not drag you through all of them. But there are a bunch of, out of these, like, 10 or 17K uh, examples, it is not clear which ones are actually useful for me. Many of them will be partial. They will not show me the full scenario. Well, maybe many of them will be noisy. They'll have too much information, and the code will be entangled with code that does other stuff. And it's not clear which example should I use. So what I would like to do, I would like to use all of them. Right? The question is, how do I leverage all these examples, millions of examples, really, that are out there, to synthesize client code using a library? At this point, I want to stop and go for a second to Victor's problems from the last uh, talk. And I want to show you how I synthesize uh, Victor's uh, things very simply. So here is the, so I have three solutions for the date conversion, I think. I will not go through all of them. Yeah, so I just, <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's also possible. Yeah. Is it out there? Yeah. 
probably I can find it, but I can find on Stack Overflow like uh, kind of the same date conversion, or I can even find uh, a library that does that. So there's some boost library that you give it the start date, the days that you want to move forward, and you just get the result. So if I could, instead of do gen and test, which what is Victor doing, if I can do search and test, that will be kind of useful. If I can look out there, instead of generating this space of program as if I live in a closed world, like look at what is out there, pick up what I can, test it, maybe put some things together, that will be great. And again, what I want to show you, it's not exactly fair because I want to show you like uh, another, I tried to synthesize Victor's code, uh, red, black tree, in the same way. So I found a project that says uh, something, something, connected some problem, still not working. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if, you, if you go and you try to get this particular code, you're not going to end well. But uh, I can find you some code that at least I eyeballed and looked reasonable. So I, I want to say that this, in this kind of domain, it's very hard to pick which examples to use because the notion of similarity between examples, the notion of what people do, is it like our program's equivalent, and all these questions are very, very hard in this low-level domain, which is why we stay in our own comfortable domain of uh, uh, using library APIs. Right? So this is what I'll do from now on. And to give you some intuition to what we'll be doing, I'll, I'd like to go to some graphical uh, example, and this comes from a SIGGRAPH paper in 2007. And this, this kind of paper, actually, my, the title of my talk comes from this paper, which is scene completion from millions of examples. And what they do is they ask the following question. I have this scene here with the ocean, and I have this part which I cut out. And I want to complete it. I want to synthesize a completion for this part, and I have some spec. I want it, for example, to be smooth, I want it to be blue, and I want the gradient to, to match whatever is in the original picture. So one approach, which is a common synthesis approach, is to do like interpolation of the colors here under something without looking outside at the world, right? But what they do, which is interesting, they extract some semantic descriptor of this image, which is kind of a compact representation of what this image looks like, that is amenable to comparison operations, that's the, that's the idea. And then they look into a huge database of millions of images, millions of this, they call it the gist of the image. So they look at millions of gist summaries in the semantic index, and they find some matches, they get 200 matches. And from these matches, they do something which is nice. They try to context match with the original image. So say, this is, this is your query. This is the image that I found that is close to your query, based on the gist, based on, based on this summary. And now what I do, I do some context matching. I check, can I combine this result into your query? And if I can, I combine it, so I have this blending, and I get these 20 results, so I lose results on the way, right? So I had 200 matches, but only 20 completions at the end because it was hard for me to smoosh them together into your query. Uh, so the reason I'm showing you this is because it's get easier to get some intuition on the graphical thing, and I want to show you like, the key problems which are extracting some uh, semantic descriptor from our query, uh, building this semantic index, how do you build this kind of things for software, and answering questions like similarity, like where does this query fall, are there like, what is the distance inside this index, etc. And then there are some questions of context matching and blending, which are actually uh, ongoing, and we are collaborating with that, with uh, getting some serious firepower here from Gagandeep and Martin on this uh, context matching and blending. All right, so here's uh, how it looks for code. Uh, I give you some partial code examples. So I'm using question marks, but use your favorite notation. Uh, and this translates, this query translates to some semantic descriptor. And in, in this talk, I will use automata. You can use many other representations, but this is kind of a general cute thing that you can use. And you, have, you match it against a semantics index that is, again, many automata. And the thing I, I failed to mention is that this automata has some unknown symbols in it. So there are some question marks here that I will formalize later that says, I want to find something of a file that has a write in the middle, and I don't know what comes before it or after it. I want to match it in the index. I get some uh, matches of code. I go and I check the context. So my original query was with f and write 73, and now I found some example that does something completely different with some loop here, but I, I think that I can still smoosh them together, and then I eliminate these parts from the example, and I, I somehow merge them. So this is a tricky part. We're not gonna talk about that at all. It's nasty. All right, so 
another thing is that uh, your wish is my command. Uh, this is again, I tried to replicate Victor's uh, slide with my limited abilities. Uh, so here's an example of, I wish to get the last known location of my Android device, all right? So that's my spec. But I argue that I actually don't know what my wish is. Because when you say I want to get the last location of my Android device, uh, you're missing some part. Let me show you why. Because here's, you have to use like classes like location manager and whatever. The, the details here don't matter. What matters is actually there is a common way to get your last known location from uh, an Android device. And that way is to first use like GPS, check if the GPS is enabled. If it's not enabled, you try the network. And actually, there's some missing stuff here that says if, if the network is not enabled, you, you try some passive provider. And this kind of stuff you did not specify in your original request, right? So you just said, I want to get the last known location. So you would probably get from your synthesizer in like in absence of these examples, you'll just get something that says, get the location from the GPS, which is not how people use this thing. All right? So the, I, I argue that you actually don't know what you wish for. There's an element of discovery that, is, uh, that requires this search. You know roughly, you get uh, the result. And so the missing part, I think, for the spec is I wish to get my last known location from my Android device, but I want to do whatever everybody else does. That's like the missing part. I don't want to be correct. I just want to be wrong like everybody else. So there's, there's no notion of correctness. So it's like a C compiler, right? Nobody does the spec. Everybody wants to write a C compiler that is wrong as the others. All right, so now the technical stuff. So what do we want from the semantic index? We want to something, some machinery that will allow us to find similar programs and match these queries and do stuff like that. In an ideal world, we'll look at the set of traces of the program, compare them, do program equivalence or whatnot, but of course we can forget about that. So what we are going to do, we are going to represent temporal ordering of uh, method invocations across multiple objects. So it's not looking just as a single object, we're going to look across objects, across components, and see what happens. We need to represent partial information because of partial programs. So the premise of all of these things is that we go outside to the internet, we grab whatever code that we can find, and this is not going to be complete code. Like you're going to get one file from a project, one, one fragment from Stack Overflow, one file from wherever, from Victor's homepage, and somehow you need to represent this partial information. And later you will maybe, be, maybe succeed in consolidating this partial information. You'll get different pieces of the puzzle from different places and maybe you'll be able to merge them. I'll show an example later. And of course you need this stuff to be feasible, so you need feasible index construction and comparisons. You cannot have like exponential things and it's uh, precise enough to distinguish good from bad. So let's start by talking about concrete histories. So concrete histories, uh, I'll just give you intuition before introducing the formal stuff. What I want to do, if you give me this kind of fragment that calls f, g, and age on an object of type something, what I want to do, I want to generate an automata of this kind of sort. I want to record the sequence, I want to say, yes, f was called, then g was called, then age was called. The name of the states in this automata is not important. I just use it so I can refer to them, okay? So the information here is on the edges, the sequence f, g, and age. That's what I remember from this example. Of course, if you want to be realistic, you also need to handle things like aliasing. So if I give you this example in which I call x of f, and then I switch the pointer and I do something with the pointer y, I still want to get this history for the object pointed to initially by x, then also pointed to by y. I want to get fgh as the sequence. Right? Another thing that I would like to do is actually I plan to animate this. Uh, that's let me hide this, I cannot. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to ask you what should be the result in this case. All right, so I have an object, I get a pointer to x, I call f on it, and then I create another object from it, something else, pointed to by s. And the question is what should be the history, and then I call age of s. And the question is what should be the his history for s? And what, what we would like to do, we'd like to track somehow, when these cases arise, we'd like to track somehow the creation context in which S was created. So we want not just to know that S, uh, that age was invoked on S, we also want to know the history that led to this creation. And there are reasons for this that I maybe will explain later. I don't know if I'll have time. But the most important thing is I want to be able to deal with the unknown. So again, as I said, I have partial code. So I have some x that is maybe created, f is called on it, and now there's a mystery method that is called on it. So x is passed as a parameter to a mystery method, and I have absolutely no idea what this method does because I, have, I don't have the code for this thing. 
And so this, this, is where the, this is where it gets interesting, because what I'm going to do, I want to represent somehow this unknown information. I still want to record the fact that something may have happened on X, and that I don't know what it is. This is important because maybe other examples will give me a hint to what could happen there in the middle, and with consolidation, I'll be able to complete this missing information. All right, so now a little bit of uh, formal stuff. Uh, so the way we're going to represent histories is using deterministic symbolic automata, DSA. And like Moshe's example with the LTL and LDL, you probably cannot distinguish an essay DFA and DSA. So it's the same like the F and the S. Uh, and the DS DSA has, it's like a determinist, standard deterministic automata, but it has one quirk. It has variables that you can use as labels on the edges. Right? So the alphabet of uh, labels is the, the sigma and, uh, and the vars, so a set of variable names. And um, the rest is, I, I guess, the rest is completely standard. And, and these variables, they use to denote stuff that I don't know, unknowns, unknown labels on the edges. Okay, and they, there are different models of DSA. You can define DSAs where these labels could only be letters. You can define them as like sequences. You can define them as general regular languages. You get some, something akin to recursive state machines, maybe. Um, then you can define notion, once you have this machinery, you can define notion of assignment, uh, assignment in context. You can say, for example, that if I have this automata, this DSA, A, B, X, C, sorry, I'm using like X, Y, Z as the variables and A, B, C as actual labels. So if I have this automaton, what do you think this assignment would, would do? So ignore the epsilons here, they're just context. So I'm basically assigning uh, into X and I'm assigning this regular uh, expressions, so what do you think the result would be? So I'll show you the result. The result will be taking this edge x and installing this, this automata into, into the original one and assigning like this d, e, y, d. So now, it's, now it exists here. So it's d, e, y, d. All right? So this is what I got. And now I have to, so this is going to be my representation, and I have to define some operations on top of it. So I, I want to define operations that will allow me to analyze an individual example. So I need a way to extend the sequences. I need a way to build these automata gradually. I need to do joins, which I will do later, which I'll show the abstract domain. And I need to do uh, operations of multiple examples, such as consolidation and query matching, which is the essence of what I'm trying to do. So I will have to do... These are, these are important operations for me. Like, how do I join these automata to get rid of the question mark, to get rid of the variables, if I have alternative information elsewhere? So the motivation for all of this square matching and consolidation is to say, you gave me a partial automata with these variables, and I have many, many, many other automata out there. How do I use them to fill in the question mark, to fill in the variables, right? To, to give, like, concrete labels instead of these variables. That's what I'm trying to do all the time. So, so in a sense, maybe I should have said that earlier. In, in a sense, what I'm trying to do now, let me jump, is I'm trying to kind of formalize what does it mean to have the semantic descriptor, this query, and what does it mean to have this database, this index. So I'm just trying to define the machinery that will allow me to, to perform operations there. Okay, so the next thing I have to do, uh, which is kind of cute, I have to define order between these DSAs. And the natural way to define order between automata is language inclusion, but if you do it directly, obviously it doesn't work, right? You cannot ask, is uh, X, C contained in this A, C, B, C? Because this is just, if you treat it as a regular letter, you'll get that it's not contained, right? This is a, var a variable. You need to do something that is a little bit more sophisticated than that. Okay, and so you get to this notion of partialness which says you have to define when a word is less partial than another one, and here's, I think it's best shown by example. So here are two words. One is connect, send, close. The other is connect, x, close. And I think it's easy to agree that connect, connect, send, close is less partial than connect, than connect x, close, right? It does not, in particular, does not have this variable at all, right? Formally, we're gonna define it in the natural way, saying that this word is more partial uh, than, than this word here, than w2. Maybe I should label them. So W1 is more partial than W2 for each assignment that you can find 
uh, for W2. There is an assignment uh, for W1 that gives you that gives you equality. So here you take the empty assignment, and here you just take the assignment that says x goes to send, and you get equality. Right. So this is the, the notion of partialness. If I can complete it, then it's going to be like that. And I want to define a partial order. And the partial order is, is interesting, because there are actually two dimensions here, which is kind of unusual. You have one dimension that is the precision. And precision is the natural concept of language inclusion. So if I, say, add a loop or something, that's going to contain all strings up to that. And there is a new notion of partialness here of the individual words. So intuitively, the DSA is going to be smaller if it is more precise and more partial, which is kind of confusing. At least for me, it's confusing. Um, and I'm going to show you an example. So I have this guy here in the middle. So this is connect x close. And I'm asking you, is this smaller than the guy here on top? And if so, why? I guess by the definition I showed you earlier with the assignments, you kind of, it's easy to see. In this case, it's exactly the same sequence. So it's even very easy to see that this is contained in this. So this is bigger in my partial order. But what is maybe less obvious is that this is smaller in the partial order than this one because it is more partial. Right? So the intuition maybe, uh, instead of confusing, me, confusing you, let me give you the intuition. The intuition is that my query is going to be the partial thing. I want my queries to be at the bottom of the partial order and the more concrete information that I have in the database to, have to be on top. So I want my query to be contained in these uh, results. Right? That, that's kind of the... No, oh, I lost you. All right. Try again. So my, my, remember what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do something like this. Okay, let me, let me try and bring you back. So I have something like this automata, which I showed you in the beginning, which is the query. So I have x, close, and y. I showed it earlier with question marks. Now I'm showing it with variables. Okay? And I have on the side, I have a huge database of things that is doing like whatever, open... Oh, sorry, it was right, not close. Side open, right, close. So clearly I want, when I do the query, I want to ask like, is this query contained in this thing here? And the answer I'm hoping is gonna be yes. And there are gonna be many, many other examples. Maybe my database also has like a path that, that does open and then read versus write. I have like an automaton like this in my database and then close. And I want that to be returned as a result as well. Right? So what I'm defining right now is the machinery that allows me to ask the query, ask the question, is this query, find me all the automata in the database for which this query is contained in them. And these are the hits of the query. That's just the, my formalization of the hit of the query. Yes, Victor. You, you can, yeah, you, you can do all sorts of things. It depends on whether you assume that you have also partial automata in the Maybe I haven't thought that through, so I, I don't know. I'm guessing that yes. In general, but I just picked automata because it's very general, but it's also going to be very inefficient. And if I really want to make this work, I may need to move like to partial order or to something different. But I'm just trying to first formalize the machinery in a general way. So what you're suggesting may work as well. This is, I'm, I'm describing one experiment. I don't know. This seems to work slowly, but it works. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, this is one way which is actually quite confusing, and it's also confusing in the implementation of these things. Uh, again, because successive variables, all, all the things that you can imagine, like x, y, one after the other in the database, not in the database. Yeah. I'm curious, does your x and y imply that basically the things which are represented by x are different than the things that you represent by mm -hmm. y? They could be the same, yeah. But I'm okay. just, they could be different, that's why. But so you cannot repeat, you cannot have x write x. No, 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 no. The same thing. No, no, yeah, that, yeah, no, no but the every label is different, yeah. Okay. I should have said that with the question marks. Again, there are, these representations are endless. Yeah, you can play with this forever. The question is what, what is reasonable, right? I can 
with like constraints on the side, I can have whatever I want, but this seems reasonable. So as long as we understand this well enough to ask questions, I think I should continue. All right. So formally, you can define it in the, in the natural way. So you can say that A1 is less than A2 if for every assignment in, uh, for every assignment that you do to A2, you can find an assignment, there is an assignment for A1 such that you get language inclusion. Right. That, that's again, that's natural at that level. When you come to implement it, you get into trouble, but, but we will skip that. So here's what I want again. Like I want this partial query, I want this XC to be matched with the guy here. So I want to say this is included in this guy. And again, the definitions here, I'm all, I will always cheat by not showing a variable on the right hand side. So the case of the sigma 2 is empty. Let's show you that the assignment here says A equals C. Sorry, and, and I'm done. All right, and now I think again it's very it's kind of technical, but bear with me. That that's kind of a trick here that you may appreciate or not, which is how to compute the simulation. So th this is just a declarative definition, right? It doesn't help you. Now I want to show you simulation inclusion via simulation, and simulation. What we do is we adapt the DFA simulation to DSA simulation, and you need something. You need something that is kind of slightly different because you need to instead of pairing two states of two automata, what you're doing, you're pairing a state of A1 to a set of states from A2. And the intuition is that now, uh, basically this variable that you have, uh, you need to, it can match many, there could be many representatives in A2 that represent it. So the, the role of matching it is now partitioned as a disjunction between potentially many states because you don't know how much of A2 it swallows. Again, maybe an example would help more than these descriptions. So here's my example. I have x send close y, the green one, and I have new whatever socket x connect send close. And the question is, uh, is the red is the green one contained in the red one? Is the red one contained in the green one? What do you think? Which one is the smaller? Just intuitively. And of course, the x's are different variables, right? I can call them. Call them X and Y for your convenience. So just intuitively, forget anything that I have defined. Just intuitively, which one you would say is the smaller one? The green one. Why? Because, because I can take this X and I can swallow basically all the prefix here, right? Whatever I, whatever I can do, I can swallow all the prefix until the send and close. And this is what the simulation will do for us. So when I establish the simulation relation, basically when I say who matches this state to, I say yes, just take the whole automata on the other side and that could work for you as a match. And then continue. So your, your intuition is correct. It gets kind of tricky in other cases, which I won't show you. But what we did is just formalizing this kind of intuition so you can work with it. Okay, so how, how are you gonna actually do this? So this was all just the representation, and I think what I should show you now is how to actually, uh, how to actually do that. So we, we're, what we're going to do is we're gonna use this representation to do client-side static analysis. And it's gonna be inter-procedural, it's gonna be alias-aware, points to information, all the things that we're not gonna care about much here. I'm just gonna give you the intuition again for how this works. And again, from something like this, the goal is to go from a program like this, which does allocates a new file, open, write, close, to an automata of this sort. And again, I want to be able to handle these DSAs. I want to be able to handle calls to methods that I don't have. Right? So I could get a partial automata if this calls instead of write. It calls David. So, and I don't have the code for David because it's complicated. Then what I get is like a, a, a variable here instead. So here's an example of how should I analyze uh, whatever socket channel. So here's, here's a very simple example, it's linear code. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to have an abstraction that combines heap information together with these histories, together with these DSAs for every object. So initially, I'm gonna have some heap. I'm gonna say I have a pointer socket channel that points to the heap allocated object, and I have a history here that is basically initially just the initial state. Now I have some call to configure blocking, so I say yes, extend this history with configure blocking. Okay, so I just shorthand it to CFG here because I don't have space. And as I see connect, I add that to the sequence and I keep on adding finish and I get to the end and I got basically the sequence that is uh, the allocation, configure, connect, fi finish connect and read. And everybody's happy, or at least I'm happy. 
Of course, this is not a representative program. It had no loop, had no, uh, had no multiple objects, so that was very simple. I can look at a different program that is like this, and this program already has like uh, allocation of many socket channels. It has, it, so it creates many channels here. Where's the main here? Here. So it starts by creating many channels, putting them in some collection, iterating over the collection, doing connect on anyone, everyone, and stuff like that. And the important thing is really that I'm not going to talk about the heap abstractions at all in this talk. You can read in the paper. I would just want to talk about the history abstractions. And what happens here with the history is that the history themselves are unbounded. So they can grow without a bound. You have these loops. So the histories keep going, getting extended and extended, and you need to do something about that. What you need to do is a history abstraction. What we're going to do is we're going to do some quotient-based abstraction, which is very natural in this setting. And the quotient-based abstraction is going to use uh, what we call past-future abstraction. I think other places call it k-tail abstraction or stuff like that. You're just going to look at the automata as you're developing it. And if you see the same letter uh, repeats, if you see two states that have the same incoming edge, you fold them together. So you can define the equivalence relation between states to be based on the incoming edges, a sequence of incoming edges. So this is what we call a past uh, abstraction. You look at the incoming edge and say, like, here, this state, oh, actually, I have an animation for this. These two states both have incoming edges A, so we smash them together and we get this here. And similar here, these, these two states both have incoming edges C, and so we smash them together as well. And you can do the same thing symmetrically for the future, like basically going, looking at outgoing edges and get similar thing. And I can show you like the abstract interpretation of a simple example, which is this uh, thing with a loop. So initially, I open it, I configure it, I connect. Now I configure connect. It's like, a, sorry, finish connect, which is inside this condition. And I iterate in the loop. And after one more iteration, I get two states which have incoming finish connect edges. I do past one equivalence. I smash them together. And at the end of the while, I get these two states, which correspond to two cases. One case in which uh, I guess I went once through the loop. And another case when I iterated more. Sorry, this case sorry, is one call and not going into the while. And this case is going to the while multiple times. So is that clear why I get two kind of cases here? For the history, one corresponds to, to going through the, not going through the loop, just asking the condition once, and this corresponds to iterating in the condition several times, in the loop several times. And then what I can do, I can do join, as you expect, and get just one state, I'll skip that in the interest of time. All right, let's see what's going on. All right, great. So now I got, now I ran this on many, many, many examples. I told you millions, it's, it really is millions, and I'm getting all these uh, many different uh, DSAs for all my examples, and I want to consolidate them somehow. And the question is how? So I have this soup of automata, I want to consolidate them somehow. So I can do basically something that is based on type. I right? say so like all the automata that are for the same type merge them together, and I can get something like that, but if you uh, take that to the extreme, this is what you get. So this is not millions of examples, even these are tens of examples that are merged together by type. What happens is you get a diversity of many, many scenarios. Many of them are partial, and this is not very good. This is not a good database to, to use, right? Because when you ask a query, does it match, you'll get like this answer. That's not very good. And so what we do, instead, we merge by what we call a use case, which is you can do it by many ways. You can use any sort of clustering that you want. Uh, you can, uh, so we use the distance function. I think what is actually working right now is a distance function that looks at the set of methods that you have in each scenario, and you try to just look at things that are close in the set of methods. And once you do this clustering, it's kind of interesting because a large number, like a large percentage, up to 80% of your uh, scenarios fall into two clusters, into two top clusters. And the rest is noise, so you get also a lot of noise, like scenarios from incorrect examples or examples where analysis was imprecise. All these problems just get thrown away, kind of, by the clustering here. Uh, finally, you get to the query matching. So again, I, so you construct all this database, you did all the work, and now you get something like, uh, you, you can do stuff like taking this query, the x write, you go to the index, you find 
you find this index, and you can find an assignment. So the completion for the example is really the assignment that you find for x and y. So that's the, the way it works. And when you want to go to the code, you get into trouble because you get like code that contains all sorts of things that you may not care about, and it's hard for you uh, to map back. So uh, I, I can show some results here, but actually I want to show you the tool itself as a demo instead of showing you uh, the dry results here. You can look at them later. Uh, so let me just show you two things. Uh, the first thing I want to show you, hopefully the internet works, is like maybe recorder, Android. If I go to the official media recorder, that's like the explanation that I get from the documentation of the Android. I showed it in the beginning of the talk, and they give some examples, etc. But what I can do using our approach, if you go and you really aggregate all of these examples and you put them all together, what you get is you get one example, which is giving you the sequence that many people use, which is this sequence here. I don't know if you can see. Set audio source, set output format, this and this. And you get this automata on the side that you've actually used, uh, similar to the automata that I showed you. And you see all sorts of subtle things that will be very hard to get from synthesis from scratch, like this try, catch kind of thing around the prepare, and all sorts of things that are really kind of more tools of the trade or kind of knowledge that you need to know and is, and is captured in these examples uh, out there. I can also show you, uh, show you how to uh, receive an SMS message on your Android. Again, you get the sequence that is representative for something, and it's quite complicated. You get some the address, you get I don't know what it is even, like pseudo objects, reply path present, all sorts of things that I really don't know. And they all come up, they all like bubble up from this consolidation aggregation of the many examples. Yeah. These are, yeah, it's hard to see, I guess. These are just the API calls that are relevant to the Android API. So I say I want to receive a text message, and th these are the calls on the SMS message API. Okay, so this is the sequence of call on the SMS API message. You can get similar things for uh, getting the location. This is the, prob this is the example I showed earlier in my talk. So you get exactly this kind of GPS provider, network provider, passive provider, and these conditions between them, whether they're enabled or not. All right, and there are more examples in the talk. I'm going to skip them. And I think at this point, I'd like to just stop and uh, thank you. Okay.
think so. So we debated for a long time whether you even want to aggregate them or keep them as sequences, because for the user it may be easy to always keep them sequences instead of these splits and whatnot. But this actually captures, it is useful because it captures part of the control of the program. So you do want to distinguish if you have some looping or conditions or this. So I think, are you talking just about the representation, like technically, or about what they want to capture? So. Uh, were there examples where you wish that you had recorded uh, more? Uh, yeah, many. So right now, this formalism does not encode, like the, for example, the return value of these calls, right? So that that is definitely missing in some things because you can say like, don't worry about examples. Um, close your red light. Can find it. So I'm looking, I'm looking for GPS, yeah, this one. The GPS example, so you're asking things like, uh, is GPS enabled, then do something, and we, we don't care. The minute you ask, we say it's okay. So right? we don't capture the fact that it has to return true at that point for the next step to happen. So that's definitely, uh, another thing is we do capture, uh, I didn't show it, but we do capture parameter values. Because for the Android kind of API, you have things like get last known location. This is a stream that says, should I get it from the GPS? Should I get it from the network? Or should I get it from something else? So this, the, the API actually depends on the string literals. And it's part of they were not literals? We would not. No, we would, we would handle that. So we would not handle it. You also have an example uh, where there were actually sort of two interrelated APIs. So we, we track, so you have to track correlated objects, but if you want to go to all the correlations, you end up with like shape analysis, right? You need to track all the relationship in the heap, so forget that. So what we do, we just track relationship between objects that are created using one another. This is this creation context that I hinted on in the beginning. So if you use me to create you and we create the third guy and that's it, then I get this full sequence of things, and that seems to be a useful trade-off in practice. There are like JDBC kind of APIs in which the objects are related in complicated ways, but these are not the common case. That's like, in some sense, I would claim it's bad design. Well, if I'm thinking about uh, graphics APIs, where you have to get a graphics manager and that idea of graphics context, and then over here, I create shapes. And then you put them to get assembled. So I'm not sure how good we'll handle that. I don't think so. We're not, uh, not right now. You need to, to get the content of this configuration object and do something with it, right? Yeah, yeah so I have, I have a question that, uh, you know, You can do that as well. I think what we are hoping is that you record the fact that something happened, and you hope that other examples will help you understand what. But yeah, you could also do what you suggest. It's going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so we take one more question. Uh, how do you deal with uh, name collisions? Like, you have in two different Stack Overflow questions. Uh, two different files that uh -huh. you use. That yeah, so sometimes we don't. We, we screw up. If they're just called file, there's no package, there's no nothing. We, we may be confused to think it's the same thing. What will help you if, you know, if the method signatures are slightly different, at the end they will be separated in clustering. And if there are not enough examples of your filling file, then it will just drown in the noise. Because there, there's a lot of noise, also the analysis makes a lot of mistakes, aliasing, missing stuff. Okay, thank you.